Yanko Wango. Let's go. Yanko Wango. Let's go. I want to play it smart. Yanko Wango. Let's go. A brand new start. Yanko Wango. Let's go. Hush. I want to fly. Yanko Wango. Let's go. Give great a try. Live your best life every day with the Smart Network. Hot. Go smart. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the webinar on navigation towards the healthy mind of everyone at home. I would like to thank our sponsors, Ashisa Telecommunication Lanka Private Limited and London Stock Exchange Group Sri Lanka. Without further ado, I would inform everyone of the house rules. Kindly switch off your cameras and mute your mics. Only the speakers will use their audio and video for their presentations and dialogue. Questions from the participants will be taken on a recording of this meeting will be shared after the conclusion of the session. I now welcome Dr. Aseni Vikramathilaka to take over and commence the session. Dr. Vikramathilaka, over to you. Thank you, Nisan Salah. Uh, I hope uh, I'm clear to all. Good afternoon to all. Uh, let me start the session by introducing first a non-profitable non organization formed by qualified and competent uh, occupational health and safety professionals in the private sector to provide support and guidance in workplace health and safety. Workplace Health Safety and Health Association collaborates with many international professional organizations and they strive to make a difference in people's lives to take occupational health, safety and health to the next level in Sri Lanka to ensure a safe and healthy workforce for the future. I will uh, send the link to this website through the chat box. You can visit and see and see whether how, how this organization can support you. Right. So now starting on with the session. First, I need to remind you that 
not a single person in this world is spared experiencing these unprecedented times. Due to these uncertainties we, that have taken over and overwhelmed us, you know, we are all struggling to strike a balance between our work, our family, our friends, and our interaction with others. Also, we, we are struggling to manage our health and financial status. Businesses are finding it difficult to uh, ensure, a sm ensure smooth continuity. We have no benchmark. There is, no one has experienced in this type of uh, extraordinary times. So we all have to try to work together and ride out of this situation. A positive aspect of this current situation is that people are paying more attention to their physical and mental health. We all should take time to reflect and review the important things in life. Prior to the pandemic, all may have been in stressful situations, but nobody spoke about it. But currently, we should all grasp this situation and create further awareness on the importance of mental health and well-being and move and try to move away from the social stigma against mental health. Right. So as organizations, as individuals, we may not be able to resolve all problems encountered by us or our colleagues or our employees, but we sure can support each other and try our best to relieve our distress to a certain extent. This is the aim of this session. There are three experts. They shall be talking to you about the uh, transformation of emotional experiences during the pandemic, then how the body and the mind will react to a crisis, then the self-care strategies, organizational strategies, how you can cope, right, and uh, how to uh, build resilience. Okay, so uh, without further ado, I would like to invite the first speaker, that is Dr. Venura Paliyavadana. He is a senior lecturer at Javadana Pura University and a consultant psychiatrist at Colombo okay. South Teaching Hospital. Dr. Paliyavadana is interested in personality disorder, personal development, addiction psychiatry, and behavior modifications. Ven Venura, the screen okay. is all Thank yours. You. Thank, Thank you, you Asini. Thank you for that kind introduction. Uh, um, uh, I'm really more than happy to be here uh, today evening. Actually, it's night. I mean, night where I am now at, at Brisbane in Australia. Uh, so, uh, uh, if you know, uh, if I ask you, uh, what is the most important, most precious gift you can give to someone you love. Uh, you know, you might come up with various answers, right? Like your love, your attention, your time, uh, or your affection. Uh, various, you might come up, come up with that kind of answers. But uh, someone you love, someone you, you care for, the biggest gift you can give them actually uh, your own personal development. Uh, if you can develop as a person, if you can uh, maintain your mental well-being, if you can improve your men mental well-being, if you can elevate yourself, in other words, if you can do that, that would be the biggest gift you can give anyone you love. Because if you can't do that, let's say if you if you are not improving as a person, if you haven't developed as a person, you can't love someone. Uh, you can't care for someone. Let's say if you are not developing as a person, you won't have time for someone else. So that's why these kind of programs are very important. Uh, this is today you are taking this time, this probably like one and a half hours uh, to reflect on that aspect of you, to elevate yourself, uh, to make yourself more resilient probably. Or when that happens, you it, it will be easier to live with you. It will be easier to, you know, uh, associate with you, work with you. You would be a better friend, a better husband, a better wife, a better uh, father or a mother. So that's why this these kind of time, this type of endeavors, this type of uh, uh, engaging in these kind of activities is important. So uh, when it comes to uh, personal development or uh, improving our psychological well-being, uh, a pandemic uh, would be the best time to think about such a thing. Because uh, 
I would say what, what's happening here right now in the world, uh, this COVID-19 situation, is I would say it's, 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 it's like a worldwide psychological experiment. We are, being, we are going through it. We'll never know exactly you know, what, the, what are the exact consequences of this, actually. We can only predict. Uh, but I'm saying, uh, but this has been given us, a, you know, the pandemic has given us an opportunity to self-reflect on ourselves. Uh, well, I know most of us, you know, when I see uh, it in social media, when I see people, uh, maybe health professionals who come and talk on TV or economic economists, when they come and talk on TV or radio, they say, you know, the world, what they say is that world is waiting to go back to what it was. But I'm asking you, this opportunity which has been given to you, I know it's filled with uncertainty and unpredictability, but it has given you a break. It has taken you, uh, it has taken away those pressures, uh, those pressing uh, requirements, pressing targets, pressing goals from your life. Now you are left with your own thoughts probably, or, or, or probably with your loved ones, or maybe like three, five people with you. So are you able to capable, are you capable of managing your own, own mental well-being? when all these distractions are taken away from you. You know, we've been, uh, so this is the biggest challenge. I think, I think if we can focus on that, maybe at the end of the day, when the, when, when the, when the pandemic is over, when one day it is over, as you know, as everything else, you know, it will, it, one day, one, there would be one day where the pandemic is no more, there, right? When it, when it happens, if you had focused on that aspect of yourself, maybe you would emerge as a more resilient human being. So this little effort is actually to help you uh, to enter that path. So uh, uh, why, uh, first let's try to understand why this kind of an uncertain and unpredictable situation is so difficult to tolerate. Human mind, we crave for certainty. We crave for predictability. We want things to be predictable. In fact, our entire life, is an effort to make things certain, isn't it? We marry, we have children, uh, we study, and we look for good jobs. All these efforts are to make our life certain and predictable. So when that, when that is taken away from us, when we don't know uh, how many will, how many of us would survive this pandemic, or how many would, how many of us would be able to. Uh, Look, uh, like uh, preserve our jobs when this is over. So that uncertainty and predictability is not easy to tolerate. So one of the things we should do in a time like this is to understand this, you know, and like these fears we have, uh, this, you know, we are worried about our loved ones, right? We are, if we have, especially if we have elderly parents, or ill, someone who has some kind of physical disability, if you have children, if our life is more important, let's say we are the only breadwinner in the family, so then we are worried about our life, right? So if we, uh, so one of the major things is to understand this, you know, understand and be okay with that. You know, telling ourselves that we shouldn't be feeling like this is actually going to make things worse. One of the things we should not do like, you know, I know people would say, you know, during the pandemic, you have to some, you know, social media we, uh, is not a very good place to be during the pandemic, definitely. We see people saying, you know, learn a new, new language, learn a new skill, you know, trying to, uh, like, then you look at the, when you look at social media, you look, it looks like everybody is coping well. Then you try to compare yourself with them. Then you feel depressed. So that's not a very good strategy. So allowing yourself to feel this uncertainty and anxiety is a very important thing. And not trying to uh, run away from this, not trying to run, not trying to uh, like, you know, r running away comes with, comes in different ways. Children, we have seen like now in, in hospitals, we see a lot of children coming with uh, internet addiction, uh, gaming addiction. Adults, a lot of adults getting addicted to mobile phones, uh, their social media. Uh, so it's very common. Uh, and uh, so that, because people don't like that uncertainty. So 
your ability to tolerate uncertainty and fear is very important. And first step is noticing that it's happening and, you know, allowing yourself to experience it. Then you would have more power over it. And that's the first step. Then uh, one of the, uh, like, when times are not certain, when, the, when you don't know what's happening in your life, one of the major, most important things you could do is to have some kind of a structure to the day. Uh, maybe you are not going to your office. Maybe you don't have to, uh, like, you know, like before the pandemic, you, you know, you, your day had a, some kind of a structure. Children had a, some kind of a structure, right? They got up at a certain time and they had to catch the bus at a certain time or the school bus at a certain time. If you... Uh, and you had your life had some kind of a order and a structure and human mind likes this order and structure in a way our jobs you know our roles our social social roles they have a power to stabilize us mentally because it takes off takes away a lot of burden of decision making from us right because the day happens automatically right you get up you go to work, you come home, you you cook dinner and you sleep and you, then you go back so that order keeps us uh, stable psychologically. When that order is taken away from us, uh, then we are left with a day where we have to make a make lot of decisions about what to do and what not to do. That's not easy for a human mind. So one of the ways to cope, uh, the, one of the major way of coping with that is to have some kind of a structure to the day. Not uh, like a rigid schedule, but some kind of a structure. You should have an idea of let's say what, what time you get up right uh, and you know how many hours you are going to sleep if you and if you're work if you're working from home uh, try to make it look like you work in the office don't uh, open your emails in the in uh, you know in your mobile phone work emails but don't try to work to, towards the late at night you know try to make it we, i would even say people when people come and tell me you know, when they work, a lot of one of the major complaints people make is uh, they would say, uh, like, you know, they, they would spend more time in work, but being less efficient, like, you know, getting too many distractions, uh, stuff like that, like, uh, but they are being inefficient, but wasting more time on work. So make it look like you are in the office. I would say even, you know, dress like you are in office, like, don't, uh, don't open your laptop uh, with your night dress, like you know, while it's still wearing your night dress. So, it, so then you were mind mentality, like you know, that will give you some kind of a psychological stability. And this has, a, I see, like we see a lot of children coming with problems these days. Like children struggle a lot because school had a school system and their peers, their teachers, it had a huge power on them to stabilize their mental well being because they, you know, there's that feedback you get from teachers that feedback you get from peers and the structure the school gives you know school has a kind of a uh, one of the major things about school is it's actually not the education it's the structure it gives the like you know uh, like what to do and what to do and they would want to follow a schedule a timetable that will mentally stabilize children when it is not it's been taken away that you know we know we know that you know our children just like us like oh, they were in a kind of a rat race right like they were, uh, they had uh, uh, classes, extracurricular activities, and mm -hmm. they, they, they were, they, their days were packed with activities. Now, when it's taken away, of course, they can't uh, suddenly feel really it's, it's stable, right? So they're struggling. So being kind to them, right? You've been okay with that. And uh, noticing that, you know, like, you know, they would struggle and it, you know, because it's very hard to, Look, I mean, children want some kind of an interaction when they work. So it's it's not easy for a child to sit in, in front of a computer and study for hours. So noticing that. If you can notice their struggle, and you know, if you can, if you when you notice your own struggle, you can understand their struggle. Then they you can help them. That is one of the major things you could do with your children. Uh, then uh, I would say uh, this is a, another way. Another way we can cope with this uncertainty and fear is to look, is to use this time, this, use this uncertain and unpredictable time to reflect on your life before the pandemic, right? 
uh, think about the life we lived before the pandemic. Uh, our lives were bombarded with uh, so many, info, so much information, right? Like we were, uh, we were so busy uh, with our goals, with our dreams, with our passions. Uh, we were so busy. And our lives were bombarded with information, right? From the, the social media, from TV shows, uh, a lot of stuff. And now, when this uh, information is taken away from us, and all these distractions being taken away from us, we are now left with our own thoughts. So uh, now it's a new challenge. How many of us can sit somewhere for five minutes uh, with our own thoughts, without being distracted, you know, without uh, a need for a distraction or phone call, uh, logging into a social media account or checking our email. Uh, so how many of us can sit with, sit somewhere with our own thoughts and be okay with our own thoughts? So that ability is actually, I, I, I think, it's the next level of human evolution. So the virus has a function like anything else. Uh, its function is to test this ability, right? Of how we were living a life of distractions. Probably I would call it even a rat race. Uh, now it's been taken away from us. Uh, so are we being able to, are we capable of sitting some sitting down somewhere uh, and maybe be, being okay with our own self uh, without needing for a distraction? Then if we can improve that quality, maybe, when, because we most of the choices we made even uh, like in our life like you know what we choose uh, what we got uh, got into our lives uh, also like you know the choices maybe we made especially they were being given to us actually uh, like by the world so when you when we are able to sit down with our own thoughts and maybe on our with our own uh, let's say our own mental faculties uh, Maybe when we when when the pandemic is over, when we are again the things are, when when again things coming back to normal, then maybe we can choose wisely what we don't what we need and what we don't need. Uh, then that will that can be even a superpower, I would say. So that's what that is one of the major I think benefits of this uh, uh, pandemic. Uh, so uh, focusing on that is going to be very important. So, uh, yes. Uh, I think uh, uh, I my time. Yes, uh, yeah. yes, Dr. Venera. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, it, it's fantastic, you know, self-reflection and understanding where we are is a start, which all of us are reluctant to do. When we have to think on our, by ourselves, what we normally do is, we get a digital device and we, 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 we get hooked on to that, isn't it? So I think we all should start, you know, we all should start on self-reflection and understand our problems first, where we are before we, we go ahead and uh, support our families, our colleagues and everybody else. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Venra. Our so problem. next, <laughs> next uh, up is uh, Mr. Nivendra Uduman who is a, a counseling psychologist with seven years experience in the field of mental health in Sri Lanka. His interests include suicide prevention, psychological first aid, community, community mental health awareness and resilience building. He currently practices counseling and psychotherapy at an outpatient medical center in Colombo and also spends time teaching at a government accredited diploma program. And I know that Nivendra has supported many organizations in mental health related concerns. Nivendra is also an ardent activist in creating awareness uh, on mental health and trying to remove the social stigma. So over to you, Nivendra. Thank you, Asani. Thank you so much. Um, I hope I'm audible. Yes, you are. Thank you. OK. Um, a very good evening to everyone who's joined us today. Uh, thank you so much for making time to join this session, and I hope that uh, you find this useful. Um, so what I hope to talk about uh, today, 
I'll be sharing my presentation in a moment. Uh, what I'll be talking about is a little more about how we as human beings, as individuals, as employees, as employers, uh, can take care of ourselves uh, while navigating this very complex kind of dynamic that we are in these days, where our work lives and our personal lives are intersecting at points that maybe they didn't before the pandemic began or before working from home began, uh, and where the lines have become somewhat blurry between those um, lives uh, that we led before the pandemic. So it's about kind of talking about how we can adapt to this new way of functioning, because obviously, like Dr. Venura also spoke, uh, we have to adapt, we have to think about new ways of thinking about our lives and new ways of functioning while we reflect on uh, things that might have worked for us in the past, but also things that might be worth uh, shedding off uh, of us, of ourselves so that we can adopt new ways of uh, living, right? Um, so I'll just share my presentation with you and then we'll get started. Um, Asen, is my presentation visible? It is visible, okay. but it's not on full screen. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yes, no, that's perfect no. now. Okay. Right, so as I was saying, um, there are a couple of things that uh, we need to set as context before we start talking about self-care. So the pandemic is something that is quite outside the bounds of normal that we, are, we were used to. Even though the world had experienced pandemics in the past, uh, various kinds of disease outbreaks in the past, we have not experienced something of this nature. And we as a country were not prepared uh, for something of this nature. So this kind of took us by surprise, where we had to very quickly, uh, very dynamically change the ways we live, change the way we work. Uh, and most of our routines, our rituals, the things that we were used to doing had to also change almost overnight and the rhythm that we sort of used to live our lives uh, changed. So uh, the other thing is because the pandemic doesn't have a timestamp because we really don't have a timestamp to know that this will end by a certain time. This also makes it uh, really difficult for us to cope and also the unpredictable nature, the uncontrollable nature of this would also lead to challenges when it comes to our physical and psychological health. Um, so because as human beings, you and I are people who we call embodied, right? Well, what this means is very simply that our nervous systems, right? As human beings, our nervous system, the primary aim of the nervous system is to keep us safe. So when the nervous system detects that there is this sense of um, you know, risk around us or this sense of danger around us, around the pandemic, then uh, it starts to put us into this mode, what we call the fight or flight phenomenon. I'm sure most of you might have heard of this, uh, which then would cause challenges for us. For example, when we are in this fight and flight mode, we might feel emotions like anxiety. We might feel helplessness. Some of us might feel uh, frustration a lot. Other people might feel quite depressed. So there can be a whole range of emotions that one might feel at a time like this because our nervous system is doing what it's naturally evolutionary made to do to protect us, right? Now, the other thing is we as human beings are relational. So what this means is that you and I, we need each other to regulate ourselves, to, to manage our own selves. So for example, me in isolation, there's only so much my nervous system can do for me to help me regulate myself. Whereas when I see someone else in front of me, for example, on the screen, or when I meet someone uh, who I care about or who I feel safe with, then their nervous system will help my nervous system regulate itself. So therefore, this the pandemic has really brought uh, very close to home how important our relationships also are in terms of us looking after our physical and mental health. So getting into what I wanted to share with you today, um, so, uh, some can I just please ask uh, to turn off your microphone? 
whoever has their microphone on, please uh, turn it off because it is disturbing. Thank you. So if we talk about why we need to talk about this, uh, this concept of self-care and why, especially now, I mean, this is something that has been existing for a long time. We've talked about this before the pandemic as well, but why now, right? So there's been many changes as I spoke to you about, and a lot of these changes were not our choice, but they were changes that were kind of, in a sense, imposed on us, uh, that we had to adapt to very quickly, and we had little chance to prepare. And so much of what we cared about, so much of the things that we held important as people, so much of the routines that we were used to was very quickly taken away from us, right? Uh, our relationships were taken away from us. We sometimes may not have the ability to meet people or talk to people that we care about, uh, to see our loved ones, or we might also be cooped up with our loved ones where it might be difficult for us, right? So there's so many uh, things that have been taken away from the normal that we were used to before this, right? And the increased uncertainty and that and the effect the increased uncertainty has on our nervous system, our brain and our body um, will then also lead to a more emphasis on why we should make self-care an imperative, uh, not an option, not something that is a luxury, but an imperative at a time like this. So you would have heard of the typical uh, oxygen mask metaphor that a lot of us talk about when we talk about self-care. So if you're going on an airplane, if you've ever been on one, you'll know that uh, you are instructed in the safety briefing to wear your oxygen mask first before you help another person wear theirs. So there's an obvious reason for that. Because when we as uh, employers or employees look after ourselves, then we are able to model that kind of behavior to other people in our teams uh, and in our workplaces as well. So connected to that is that there is no one fixed way of doing this, right? It is not a black and white kind of thing. Um, it's, it's a process. It's about trying out different strategies and trying to find out what works for you, right? And it doesn't have to be something that takes up a lot of resources or money or time, but it can be even, for example, 10 minutes of your day that you engage in doing something for yourself, as simple as spending some quiet time uh, with yourself at the end of the day. So it doesn't have to be these uh, luxurious, fashionable things that we see on social media when we talk about self-care, because that itself can lead to us having this sense of uh, a vicious cycle forming, right? Where we see these really luxurious, beautiful looking things people do in uh, calling it self-care. And then we ask ourselves, why am I not doing this? Why can't I do this? Why don't I have enough time or money to do all of this? How come these people are doing all of this and showing this really perfect life when I'm really struggling? So by, by kind of telling us ourselves that narrative, we then put ourselves down into a bit of a rabbit hole where we would start uh, a lot of comparisons, right? So the message uh, I'm trying to really leave you with is that this is a very individual thing. It's about you finding out uh, what resonates with you. And the other important thing to think about in the context of work and organizations is that Self-care alone cannot exist if there is no community care, right? So, so if employers and HR and uh, other leaders are not modeling that sense of care for their staff, not showing that their staff is wanted, or not demonstrating to the staff that their well-being is important, then it's really unfair sometimes of us to expect other people to start looking after us, looking after themselves. Uh, overnight. So it's about really creating that culture, which a uh, lot of organizations do have in Sri Lanka, but I think there's a very urgent, immediate need to really have policy around well-being, which I think uh, Barney will speak about later. Um, and the other thing is that um, we don't have to be this, uh, you know, person who has this perfect image on uh, Instagram or on Facebook when it comes to how we look after ourselves, but it's about really um, doing what we can to get through the day and to try to thrive through the day. So the ultimate goal is that we aspire towards this every day. It is not something that just drops on your uh, head overnight, right? The other thing is by taking care of ourselves, we aspire to create a life where we don't feel this urge to run away from all the time, where we don't feel this urge to escape from all the time, but we a life that we can sit with 
a life that we can contain rather than wanting to always distract and escape like Dr. Venura was talking about earlier as well. So this involves our mental health, right? This is not just the spa dates and the bubble baths and the, all those things that we see, but it involves at the core our mental health as people. We're really asking ourselves how we're doing, how are we feeling, what is our, what is our body feeling like, uh, what am I feeling like in my, um, you know, internally. Um, and really questioning those things on a daily basis and building that sense of awareness, right? So it involves our mental health a lot and also, of course, our body because the brain and the body, as most of us know, are very, very interconnected and everything that affects the mind or the brain affects the body and vice versa. A lot of the time, especially in our country, because the narrative and discourse around mental health is very limited, still, uh, we tend to separate the brain from the body or the mind from the body most of the time. We see the brain or the mind as this very different separate entity that is kind of floating around and the part which is neck down is what we give the most importance to sometimes. Uh, but I would really like to emphasize and ask you to also um, begin to see yourself as a whole person rather than just these two very different parts of yourself, right? So no one solution fits all. We already spoke about this. Um, so getting into some of the strategies very quickly, uh, things that you can do, little things you can do in your day-to-day -day life to create some balance and to make the process of maybe shifting from working from home to going back to work, if you're doing so, less stressful and more productive for you. So uh, this person called Russ Harris, um, who is Australian uh, medical professional, came up with this acronym uh, in terms of self-care of COVID especially. He called this face COVID. Uh, I'll go through this very quickly just to give you an idea. So F stands for focus on what's in your control. So what he meant by this is, like uh, Dr. Palihavadhan also spoke about this briefly, saying how we sometimes tend to worry ourselves with things like whether I'll get infected, whether some, someone I love will get infected, whether uh, we'll go into lockdown again. And those are not necessarily things that we can control, but what we can control is how I look after myself, how I look after people I care about, and what I and the stories that I tell myself are things that I can control. A stands for acknowledge your thoughts and feelings. So just um, acknowledging that you're feeling anxious or you're feeling scared or you're feeling low or you're feeling disappointed or frustrated or helpless uh, or you're having the thoughts that something bad is going to happen or, or uh, I might get sick. Whatever, whatever these thoughts or feelings, whether they're positive or negative or neutral, just to acknowledge that they're there because that itself takes the weight or the edge of some of those very difficult feelings that we might have. Connect with your body. Um, so what that just means is use your body to, to help yourself feel more anchored uh, in the present moment. So I'll just very quickly demonstrate one very easy way to do that when you are working or when you are involved in something that requires your focus. Uh, so using different parts of our body. So for example, your fingertips, right? So just uh, pressing your fingertips together gently like this can be a way for you to ground yourself, just to bring your awareness back into the body, back into the present, when you feel like uh, you're a little all over the place or your focus is going a little off or your mind is going on its own little uh, you know, trip, uh, to bring yourself back into the present. Or pushing your feet firmly into the ground, pushing your feet firmly into the ground while you're seated is another way to do that. Uh, rubbing your hands briskly is another way to do that. So there are different strategies. Engage in what you're doing. So what that just means is bring your focus back into your work. Commit to what you stand for, what your values are, right? Commit to what you need to stand up. Are you going to stand up for uh, staying safe and looking after yourself? And is that connected with what you value? And would that also then bring value to the work that you do? Um, identifying resources. So just know what kind of resources are available? Do you, does your organization have an EAP program? Does your organization offer counseling services? Do they have healthcare facilities? Or in the community, where can you find the support that you need? And finally, even if you're going back to work, remember to disinfect and distance, uh, which is not uh, rocket science, which we've been hearing about a lot. So I would really remind you to focus on that as well. So, um, I'm going to just quickly take you through some other strategies. So supporting our daily rhythms, right? So creating routine uh, was already spoken about. 
So just having a regular bedtime and a wake time can really help. Uh, making sure your work feels separate from your other things that you do at home. Uh, not using the laptop or the phone in the bedroom if you can, but having a designated space for that. Uh, the other thing is creating timestamps. A lot of the time we lose track of time, especially now. Some days I myself wake up and I wonder what day is it or what time is it. So just from time to time, noting what day and what time it is can also help you feel more anchored in the present. Take regular breaks, focus on your physical health. So hydration and nutrition, again, this is not something completely alien to us, but uh, we might neglect some of this because of the stress that we're already experiencing and might be inclined towards using things like coffee or Red Bull or sometimes even cigarettes uh, to keep ourselves stimulated so that we can focus on our work. Or because of the stress and the kind of difficult emotions we might be feeling, we might also use things like alcohol or other kinds of drugs uh, to make ourselves feel better, to anesthetize ourselves, to numb ourselves from these difficulties we are feel, uh, feeling. But I want to tell you that most of the time that would create a further uh, growth in the discomfort that you feel as well. So it's just something to think about. Then uh, to do with our thoughts, right? Now, I'm sure if you were used a non-stick pan, you would have heard of the term Teflon, right? So Teflon, uh, our positive thoughts are more like Teflon where they don't stick around for too long, but they come and they go. Whereas our negative thoughts tend to be more like Velcro. They tend to be more sticky. They tend to get stuck on a little more faster than the positive thoughts. So aspiring and training ourselves to be more like Teflon where we uh, also bring in the positive thoughts. We acknowledge the positives in our lives. And we try as much as possible to unhook ourselves uh, from the negative thoughts that might tend to latch on, right? Then labeling what you're feeling or thinking. Oh, there's anxiety. Oh, there's that feeling of frustration. Oh, there's that thought that I'm really, really, really fed up. Uh, naming it itself might lessen the sense of threat that you feel because of these thoughts or feelings. Set realistic expectations with everything that's going on. Um, I would really ask that we focus on being compassionate with ourselves rather than always criticizing ourselves and saying, oh, you're not doing enough, you should be doing more, everyone else is doing so much on social media, why am I such a loser, right? So you might have these kinds of thoughts, but in those times, just remind yourself that what you are feeling right now is a universal kind of truth. Everyone in most parts of the world would be feeling similar things as you are doing now. Right, So those are some things to think about in terms of your thinking. And then for our bodies, uh, engage in some physical activity at least 30 minutes a day if you can. Again, no pressure, but at least for three times a week if you can engage in some physical activity can be helpful. Then there is something called sleep hygiene. Right, So what this means is just very simple tips that you can uh, think about to enhance the quality of your sleep. So one is having regular bedtime and awake time. Um, the second thing, avoiding things like caffeine, Coca-Cola, alcohol, and things like that too close to bedtime because that would, again, stimulate your mind and not allow you to sleep. Um, making sure temperature and lighting is adequate in your room. And most importantly, uh, our best friends these days are devices. Uh, remembering to maybe disconnect from them at least 30 minutes before you go to bed so that uh, you're not disturbed. So just using little things like that to enhance uh, the quality of your sleep can be helpful. Relaxation techniques. So deep breathing or listening to guided meditations. There are apps that I will share with you at the end of the presentation, which you can download on your smartphone and use uh, to practice relaxation as well. And using the grounding techniques we spoke about and also grounding techniques like this. Very simple, five, four, three, two, one, right? So when you're seated working, when you feel like there's a lot going on, you're overthinking or there's a lot of stress that you're experiencing, just stopping for a moment and just reminding yourself to acknowledge five things that you see in front of you. So if you're sitting somewhere, you notice the fan, you'll notice the fan switch, you'll notice the door, you'll notice something else. Five things that you see in front of you. Four things that you can touch. So maybe your shirt maybe the pen that you're writing with. So like that, four things that you can touch. Three things that you can hear around you. So maybe uh, sounds in your room, but sounds also outside that you can focus on. Two things that you can smell. So maybe keeping something that you like to smell by your table where you work can be really helpful at a time like this. So 
I like to smell axe oil uh, because it really does have a very strong uh, smell and it helps me come back into the present. Whereas you might have different other things that you like. And finally, one thing that you can taste. So just something that has a bit of a sharp flavor, like a small piece of ginger or biting into a small piece of green chili or biting into a cream cracker that is really crunchy uh, can also help us ground ourselves. So just trying some of these things out, right? Okay, so finally, uh, these are the apps that I spoke to you about. So the first three apps, Calm, Headspace, and Insight Timer, are apps that have guided meditations uh, for you to listen to and do. These range from five minutes to one hour. So depending on how much time and how much time you can commit, you can use these kinds of strategies as well. The fourth one, Catch It, is an app where you can catch your thoughts, especially those negative, unhelpful, unproductive thoughts, Put it down and it helps you reflect on and maybe reframe some of those thoughts. Change the way you think about certain things so that therefore the way you feel and the way you respond to how you feel would also change. And finally, three good things. So just noting good things that happen to you every day. Uh, just recording three things at the end of the day on the app. Good things that happen in your day so that you can remind yourself that you can also accumulate positive things in the most trying of circumstances. And when everything feels a little dreary or when you feel down or fed up, uh, this app could be something that could remind you that there is also so much of positives of good that is happening around you as well. So that is what I have to share with you today. And before I go, one last thing is that, especially if you are a team leader or an employer or an HR manager, I would really ask you to consider uh, this message. It, the message is that this concept of loyalty to an organization, um, there's this implicit message going around, especially in Sri Lanka these days, that loyalty from an employee is most often shown through the amount of work they put in beyond what they're expected to do. So crossing those boundaries, working late into the night, taking on more than they can chew. Uh, because in their minds, they have been kind of conditioned to believe that that is the way you show loyalty. And then obviously what it does do is it creates a very negative impact on their mental health and well-being. So I would ask you to really consider uh, modeling very healthy boundaries when it comes to work and their personal lives as well. Um, and to give the message very clearly to employees saying that it's not about working late into the night or answering emails at odd hours of the day just because your boss sends you something, but it's about maintaining that balance so that you're able to be more productive the next day. And that involves you educating your team leaders and managers as well about how important it is to have their own boundaries with their employees when it comes to uh, how much work they do during the day. I think Barney will talk about this a lot more next. So that's it. Thank you so much. Uh, and have a good evening. Thank you so much, Nivendra. I, I mean, the key point even for me was, you know, start being compassionate with yourself first, because if you don't practice it yourself, you cannot preach it, isn't it? So I guess we all have to reflect and start with ourselves, even the employers, uh, everybody, employees, employers, everybody has to, and, and we have to show by example i think i think that is the best way forward thank you so much nivendra for that that was fantastic so next is uh barney chandrasena she's a diversity and inclusion manager at london stock exchange group so barney uh, focuses primarily on uh, strategic initiatives at the london stock exchange group in sri lanka uh, also future proofing our talent as well as pipeline through ensuring that we create and sustain an inclusive culture and focus on the well-being of our employees. Her experience and exposure leading to human resource, resources function at LSEG, as well as a range of organizations across multiple industries has positioned her to lead this program here in Sri Lanka. She is also a single mother of a 14-year-old son, and I think her parenting experience as well as growing up in rural Africa, right? And also her secondary education, higher education in, in US, all that has uh, given her quite a lot of unique perspective to life. 
uh, and uh, Barney believes that her strengths lie in integrating her professional and personal experience into influencing others to be open to change. So Barney will guide us on some practical measures in developing organizational strategies and how to build, build resilience within and among us. Over to you, Barney. Thank you, Aseni. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, um, yes, yeah, so uh, I, I, I make it a deliberate process of actually when I introduce myself, I talk more uh, about my whole self instead of just um, my work, because I find that those are some of the things that we all should try to integrate because we tend to think of work as one word. Um, um, uh, home life, family life, personal life separately. And I think bringing all of this together is one of the things that um, uh, I have been trying to do and part of my job at the London Stock Exchange Group in Sri Lanka, which started before the pandemic, uh, I have to say, but uh, kind of became front and center when the pandemic hit. Um, I have a couple of slides which I'm going to try and um, Put up now to try and structure the next 15 minutes. Uh, just bear with me. One second, please. Um, can you all see my screen? Not yet. Not. Yeah, there's something. Again. I seem to have lost the ability to share the screen. Why is that? It's been there. Do you want me to share it, Barney? Uh, let me just try one last time if it works. Can you see it now? Yes. Perfect. Sorry. Let's just start properly. Apologies for that. OK. Technology can be a stress <laughs> trigger. <laughs> Um, OK, so thank you for inviting the London Stock Exchange Group um, here today um, and uh, listening to Venura and Nivendra. I think what I am going to share is I'm not going to repeat what they've said because those are exactly what we have learned and what we've what we've done as a company is to try and put some strategy around how we can bring some of those feelings, those boundaries, those structures to how our employees work in the company. Um, this was something that we've been wanting to do and we started three years ago, Like, but like I mentioned, all the training, all the focus just became a lot easier with the pandemic because I think people became a lot more open to um, trying to deal with it and asking for help, which in one sense helped my job um, quite a bit. Um, so if I dive into... Um, what we did. So if you talk about well-being and um, putting on my uh, hat as a well-being manager in the company, it was all about employee engagement um, and how we would engage employees in order for them to, sorry, somebody's video and sound is on. I think it's turned off now. Yes. Um, so we, I've tried to structure this in a couple of steps to try and make it easy to understand. Um, so the first step I'd like to um, talk about is um, what, when we talk about well-being, what does it actually mean? What are we talking about? Um, because um, like Nivendra mentioned and like Venura mentioned, it, it's many things. It's all interconnected, but most of us are logical beings, so we kind of need to break it into some sort of boxes. So what we do, uh, what we did at LSEG was we uh, kind of put it into three boxes. There's physical well-being, um, you know, which is the active lifestyle. Um, why is that important? How do we keep our uh, lifestyle active? And we made a 
big distinction between um, you know being physical or doing sports versus just being active going for a walk every evening going outside for a walk every evening those kinds of things and also adding nutrition to it because we wanted people to understand that it's the simple things that you have to do especially in the pandemic because you don't have the luxury of maybe your usual lifestyle um how you bring in that activity and um good simple healthy food natural food into your lifestyle financial health is another one that we um felt was very important to focus on um this for us actually stemmed from um, we do a lot of short you know pulse surveys um employee engagement surveys and um when the pandemic started one of the surveys that i did was trying to understand how people feel um and what was triggering them to feel stressed um i think i've done three surveys through the last one and a half years and in every one of them the highest trigger what stresses everybody the most was financial um when we broke it down what we realized is we don't seem to be very good at managing our funds how we spend our money how we save before we invest uh, balancing learning to save first before we spend simple tips but we felt those were important aspects because if not we are always running after the money but none of us seem to know how to save that money so for we are running forever um so we found that helpful and we did it in small sessions um because we wanted people to understand simple things like you know credit cards which is a pain all of us need it but at the same time real problem in our lives so bringing those things home and explaining to employees how to manage their funds um talking about um, financial literacy um how to start saving those kinds of things um got a lot of good responses and feedback so we continue that next of course mental health which is why we are here um but like everybody else said i'm not going to repeat it it's all interconnected and um making sure employees understood that all of this matters to their well-being and that this journey starts with them um there could be support the company provides there could be support that their managers would could provide but all of that doesn't work unless you take ownership and realize this is your destiny that you're trying to uh, improve on like um dr venura said it's about realizing self development improving yourself starts with you um some stats i thought uh, might be worth sharing uh, these are global stats not sri lankan and i guess one of the problems we have in sri lanka is we don't have these stats just for sri lanka uh, but the global stats say that um there are one in four people will experience mental health conditions in their lifetime um we also know that 75% of mental health issues develop before the age of 24 so if you think about those stats um how i looked at that was if i think of a team of 10 people that i have at least two people at any given time are struggling with mental health so that also helps us understand that this is not just this one off one in a thousand problem that somebody could have so we needed to bring it home to our everyday work to our everyday lives um and we needed to come up with ways to actually translate that and message that to our employees um the strategy that we used was first um we spoke a lot about helping everybody understand what is what is in it for them um uh, we used nivendra in uh, lscg so i'm not going to repeat it but a lot of what nivendra said were were some of the uh, techniques some of the messages that we used because people needed to realize that they needed to look after themselves first um i know we get very stressed and we get very upset with our managers and our companies um uh, and rightly so but at the end of the day you have to make that decision that your life and your well-being and your peace of mind is more important than everything else so it actually starts with you and we wanted to empower our employees to feel that way um but let me be a little selfish as a company perspective how we looked at it was if um 
our employees um, are more aware of themselves. That meant they were better in control of their actions and their thoughts, which meant that how they build relationships with colleagues, with um, their managers, with their clients is a lot more positive, which in my eyes is productivity. So at the end of the day, if you want to look at it from a business perspective, having healthy, uh, well employees is a business imperative also. So what we tried to do was to connect all these dots and connect them very transparently with employees, with managers, because we needed people to want to do this for themselves, not just because I said so or the company said so. Um, so the approach we took was we wanted to create some sort of platform of information. And when I say platform, it doesn't necessarily mean a tech platform, but we wanted to make sure that there was enough information made available to our employees um, to actually connect these dots for themselves. Um, and we felt that was the best way to do this because like Nivendra very clearly said, the journey each of us go is not the same journey. The, the place I am at would be very different to somebody else. So I can't say here, everybody takes step one, step two, step three. It doesn't work like that. So giving um, uh, bite-sized information so that employees can understand and figure out what works for them. Is it a, a quick solution? Is it a more long-term solution? No, I need professional help. No, just talking to a colleague might be good enough. Um, I'm impacting my family, so what do I need to do with my family? Those kinds of decisions we didn't want to make on behalf of our employees. We wanted our employees to be able to make those decisions, be, be uh, educated enough to make those decisions, um, and then of course, us provide the solutions. Um, we brought in, so obviously awareness started with lots of you know, sessions like this, like the sessions we're having here. I think Nivendra has been on a couple of sessions um, on behalf of LSCG. We had lots of different conversations um, with different types of people. We brought in, introduced what mindfulness was. We brought in psychologists like Nivendra. We brought in employee stories, employees who were happy to share their journey on well-being. Um, you know, we had colleagues who had gone through um, a depression after the pregnancies. They were happy to share their stories. So, of course, people have to be brave enough to want to share their stories. But what we felt was because we started talking about this over a period of time and making it less of a stigma, we actually got more and more people putting their hand up saying, yes, we don't mind sharing the story because uh, I'd like to think we kind of broke down this whole thing about judgment. Um, the last step here that I'll spend a little bit more time on is to try and give you some of the activities that we started doing. So um, this is all about giving the knowledge to the employee and we gave it in many different forms. Um, so Nivendra mentioned hotlines or numbers to call. So um, Employee Assistance Program, EAP, is a, a a strong solution that we have at the London Stock Exchange Group. Um, there is a global solution, but we also have local solutions because we're mindful that people, uh, when you are stressed, want to be able to speak in your local language. Um, you know, sometimes people are not comfortable doing it over the phone. They actually want to meet somebody and talk about it. So we gave them that flexibility, but these were all external solutions so that they felt comfortable that that confidentiality uh, was maintained and uh, you know their managers or HR didn't know all that detail. If there was only, to be fair, there was only one person who kind of connected all these dots in the company and that was me because uh, we wanted to give um, employees that confidence. Um, we also wanted to try and encourage um, employees who were one step ahead, who wanted to get involved, um, and to give them information and opportunities to learn more about it. So uh, Mental Health Champions was another um, uh, campaign that we started. It was volunteers in terms of you could sign up. Nobody was forcing anybody to sign up. Uh, it could be anybody. It could be a manager. It could be an individual at a junior level. It didn't matter. And by volunteering, what you were getting was a, a training on understanding what stress is, how stress the stress triggers you, 
um, what you can do when you are triggered. All these were all things that we felt would help break the stigma that we have um, in Sri Lanka, especially about mental health. Um, and because it was volunteer based, um, we wanted to find out whether people were comfortable talking about it. Um, I was pleasantly surprised within the first six months, we had about 80 employees who signed up over different programs um, who wanted to learn more. And that gave us the confidence that one, people are interested, two, to take it further from that group, there was two, um, I'm sorry, employees who were um, ready to say, OK, now I understand it. I know how to handle it for myself. I want to help others. So that would be another good way to actually extend that into a company, into teams um, where you could actually allocate uh, these mental, uh, mental health champions into different departments to support managers um, when you have concerns, issues within your team. We did a lot of training focusing on the managers specifically. Um, why? Because at the end of the day, if you're trying to create a culture, the cultures start within teams, within the small groups that um, that are in the company. Who controls or who can influence those teams? It's their line manager. So we um, did a lot of, so when I say a lot of effort was put into it, so global training there is. So for example, before we do any sort of performance management cycle starts, there is training. Um, media reviews, etc. have training. Now those are what all of us are familiar with in companies. What we made sure was we didn't have something called mental health training separately. We put in the component of being a manager, checking up on your team, how you would check up on your team as part of those trainings so that managers realize to do their everyday job, mental health and checking up on mental health of their team and being more aware of themselves was part of their everyday manager, excuse me, manager job. Um, as we progressed, this I'm going to say is maybe towards uh, the last six months, we realized we had done a lot of uh, general training, awareness building. Let's actually go one step further and actually try to help the different groups or different cohorts of people in the company. And what I mean by that is we had special programs where child psychologists were talking to parents because um, a lot of parents were struggling with, uh, you know, they were losing their cool. They were, weren't sure how to actually help children because now they were all stuck at home. Um, so, you know, we realized we'd want to give those different kinds of solutions wherever possible. I mean, it doesn't cost a lot of money because there are psychologists out there who are willing to come and speak. Nivendra was one of those. He introduced us to a lot of other child psychologists also. Um, so that was one side. Like I said before, we did a lot of training focusing on managers. Um, the latest program we did, which was a trial, again, uh, we wanted to try it, but it was very successful, was we actually focused on trainings for millennials. Now, if I uh, look at the London Stock Exchange Group uh, population, uh, nearly 70% of our um, employees are millennials, um, you know, under about 35 years of age. So we thought, is there a different way to try and connect with them? And... Um, we did a, a slightly different program in the language we used, in the kind of examples we used there. And what we realized was the engagement only grew. I guess we lost Barney for a little while. Let's try to get her back. OK, till we get Barney back, um, I don't see any questions in the chat box, so I would encourage people you know, to uh, please type in questions if you all prefer to, since we have a, quite a large number of participants, 
it's kind of a little bit difficult to raise your hands and ask questions unmuting yourself but we could try that you know you can ask in um, singhala or english we are happy basa dekemma onama prashnayak ahanna puluwa mokada me meka me manasika saukya kiyanne me basawa ekka tiyana prashnayak neme ite eke hinda api ekata visindum hoyanda apita tiyana prashna mona hari ahagena dana ganna puluwan na me ona vidihakata prashna ahanna puluwa e adala prashna tika me ahanna ऐसा काम मटे में अनेक पैनलिस्ट लगे में अनेक स्पीकर्स लगे प्रश्न या कहाँ न कहाँ न पुलवा बानी आप हो रीजॉइन वैन खा में ऐ वाई वाई इस दर जेंडर गैप इन एड्रेसिंग एंड एक्नॉलेजिंग मेंटल हेल्थ फैनुरा Nivendra, yes. are you all able Good to question. answer that? Right, <laughs> because I I I see sometimes I feel that Godaka hitra meka me me tikak me female sector kata bara dea kiela. Right, eh eh me kaak tiyano eh me kaak kattera me tiyano adh mukhad. Dr. Nivendra, you wanna go? Ah, hunda 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 prashneya. Kitaam hunda prashneya. प्रश्न उत्तर प्रश्न मुख्य तो कंफर्टेबल का एक और एक इमोशनल लिटरेसी एक इमोशंस आईडेंटिफाई कर गाने का नेगेटिव इमोशन ने का आईडेंटिफाई कर गाने का एक्सप्रेस करने भी दिया लेकिन एक और एक परिमेय के एक्सटर्नलाइज बिहेव एक्सटर्नलाइजिंग बिहेवियर्स के लिए जा जाते हैं सो दे ट्राई टू लाइक दे डोंट सी द प्रॉब्लम Uh, notoriously very low inmates, uh, and also there is this thing called uh, toxic masculinity. Uh, like you have to look strong, Kenika. Uh, you have to look that you are in control. You shouldn't cry. Eva ke concept si Kenika. Eka nisa pirimya ya at that suffering level le goda kwadi. Goda externalized behaviour si Kenika. Goda kaya gambling, uh, anger, uh, alcohol abuse. Uh, when a uh, uh, substance abuse badly premier ke to kora crime karana gati ya violence ek perpetrators of crime mein or victims of crime mein jahan se ka badly early death badly accidental death e patta badly ehema wenne heetuwa godak welawata mental well being ekey prashnayak tiyena nisa ithin avasana attatama thawa honda pattak tiyena nivendra tiyaka honda nivendra mata wada honda vistara karaya ekayala godak den podde ki podi langadi chuttak mails lage help seeking patta podak wedi wela tiyena vasanawakata apita eka peena tiyena apita clinical practice ekey godak mails la help help ekey illana gatiyak tiyena saha mail mails la den identify kara ganna gatiyak tiyena meke mental well being eka life ekey loku kayallak kiyena eka एक रिजेक्ट कराने में एक प्रतिक्षेप कराता एक तीन नवदा उधर उठा तीन एक इधर एक मेल से प्रेजेंट वैन्ने वैन्ने विधि एक टेट आईडेंटिफाई कराना हमारो ही सहा आर एम्पाटाइज कर एम्पाटाइज कराना अब तो हमारो मिन सम्मानी से एंग्री यू कांट एम्पाटाइज इधर मिन तो हमारी सैड यू कैन एम्पाटाइज इधर ए ह विशेष दैत्य में मैं पुरुषाधिपत्य किए नहीं कर पेट्रिया की किए नहीं कर आप ही गोड़ा के लारी था ने मैं पुरुषाधिपत्य एक खांता वट सह विनत लिंगी कहो इसलिए पुरुष समाज वाली आनान्यता वाली अंतियना ऐड तमाय ओके बालपा ने किला बैठते हैं मैं पीरी में आप ही तात पुरुषाधिपत्य किए नहीं कर बालपा गन गन में हंगीम किया ने आप ही पेन्ना न हो दे वने वे ही हंगीम किया ने आप इधर दैनिक न सुधु सुए वने वे ही अंडान न हो दे ना फिर इमिगेन्ट कुना हम बैठूना हम नेगेटिव नो ने इन दरके न अंडान न बै 
අම්මයි තාත්තයි ඇවිල්ලා තුවාලෙට බෙහෙත් දාන්න නැහැ ඔයාම නැගිටලා ඒ වේදනාව දරා ගන්න ඕනේ. ඉතින් මේ වගේ පණිවිඩ පොඩි කාලේ නම් අපිට ලැබෙනකොට මේ සමාජයේ අපේ අතර තියෙන මේ පුරුෂාධිපත්‍යය හෝ පේට්‍රියාකි කියන එකයි මේ ඩොක්ටර් වෙනුර කියපු මේ ටොක්සික් මැස්කියුලිනිටි කියන දෙක මේ දෙකම එකට වැඩ කරන දෙකක්. ඉතින් ඒ දෙකත් එක්ක අපිටම තමයි ගොඩක් වෙලාවට පිරිමිය වශයෙන් හානියක් ඇති වෙන්නේ. මොකද අපි අපේ සෞඛ්‍ය මානසික සහ කායික දෙකම රැක බලා ගන්න එක බොහොම අඩුවෙන් කරනවා මේ හේතුව නිසා. ඉතින් අසේනිගේ ප්‍රශ්නට උත්තරය දෙන්න මගේ උත්තරය තමයි ගොඩක් වෙලාවට මේ පුරුෂාධිපත්‍යය කියන දේ නිසා තමයි මේ මේ දේ වෙන්නේ හැබැයි මේ ළඟකට ඉඳන් ඩොක්ටර් කිව්ව වගේ ගොඩක් තරුණ විශේෂයෙන්ම තරුණ පිරිමි අය ගොඩක් අය උදව් ලබා ගන්නවා කියන එකත් අපි දකිනවා. Thank you both. Perfect answers. because godak uh, wedapalawal wala pirimi innawa idi meka wedapalawal wala me loko prashnayak wela thiyena mokada mental health kiyana kora hamoma ah oka gena katha karanna onne nae wage ehema they don't try to address it right from the manager the uh, employers down to uh, everybody employees everybody so i think we should uh, break away from that kind of a stigma and uh, try to help everybody now we have got bardi back so we'll hand the uh, reds over to bardi again over to you bardi bardi i see you on have you lot you're unmuted can you hear me now sorry muted yeah yeah can hear you now okay, okay. I just wanted to take 2 minutes to uh, I feel like it's connected to um everything that uh, Venura as well as Nivendra said about mindfulness. So because mindfulness is also something like exactly what you all said um meditation eva api karanne um it's re- related to religion eka eka apita hariyanne naha kiyen eka we had a lot of that kind of feedback also. So eka uh balance karanda and eka test karanda and uh, we're a tech company you can me statistics willing tamai and data willing tamai api um uh, you know that's kind of how we we think um api we did it as an experiment i know venura you mentioned that the whole of the covid was an experiment but we actually tried to uh, test ourselves on what does mindfulness actually do so what we did was we signed up with this professor who did a 10 our program over 8 weeks um and it was 1 hour a week that those people who signed up had to go for that session he gave them techniques and he spent that 1 hour every week to help them one understand and create a habit um he did a survey at the beginning and he did a survey at the end of the 10 weeks 8 uh, weeks to um test a few things to see whether it actually helps and i i have to admit i was totally shocked um because i'm like what can you do in 10 weeks <laughs> 8 weeks right but the four areas that he focused on um in terms of how he questioned was attention your attention your uh, ability to um spend time focusing on an attention span do you have you know how long your attention span is self awareness self acceptance and being able to stay in the present staying in the now those were the four things that he assessed through a questionnaire uh, at the beginning of the 8 weeks and at the end of the 8 weeks um and the results were at the end of the 8 weeks 28 the the people who were feeling stressed their stress level they felt reduced by 28% so it's 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 called perceived stress but realistically stress is something you put on yourself right so it's uh, if you perceive that you are stressed you are stressed if you perceive that you're not stressed you're not stressed it dropped by 28% and self awareness improved by 35% so for us that was quite amazing that something as simple as spending those 8 hours and creating that habit of being a little bit more mindful and that's why we say you have to do it yourself nobody else can make you mindful made a huge difference in how people dealt with everything that came their way whether it be pandemic related whether it be stress at work whether it be children um you know all of the aging parents you know covid testing all of these things are
OK, I think we lost uh, Barney again. Uh, this is this is the norm of our lives, isn't it? We shouldn't be stressed. Uh, this is this is what happens to all of us. So there are a few questions. You know, you just have to laugh and say, okay, there are uh, 150 uh, participants. Hey, but I'm not stressed. Okay. So Nivendra and Dr. Vendra are there to back me up. So there are a few questions. I'm I'm happy to say that the, uh, the participants are sending some questions this way. So the first question is, since we were kids, we were told it's not good to cry. Okay. And it's bad to cry. But there are instances when crying can actually be a form of therapy. I just like to get your idea on this because I think it does impact a person's mental health. Linda? Yeah. Uh, I'll just, uh, my thoughts about that is I think crying is a very healthy thing to do. Uh, there's absolutely nothing wrong with crying. Uh, and of course, psychologically or mentally, we all know that it has a benefit where it can act as a release for what we're feeling. It can act as a way of acknowledging our own pain or our own feelings, which is, I think, a first step into recovery or healing from something. And physically also, we know that uh, when our body releases tears, it also releases a lot of toxins that are inside uh, the body. So physically also, it has a benefit. Um, yeah, so those are my thoughts. And I think there's absolutely nothing wrong with uh, men, women, anyone um, crying. Yeah. And also this uh, uh, notion that you have to be happy all the time. I think it's a very uh, like unhealthy notion propagated by these uh, <laughs> clueless uh, uh, self-help gurus and motivational speakers. Uh, 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 they, uh, you know, this uh, they propagated the idea that you have to be happy. Like, you know, having a negative emotion is bad, uh, and that's why, like, in our culture, like we tell people, like children, like, don't cry, don't panic, uh, don't be jealous. Uh, like, you know, try to uh, curb their negative emotions. Uh, try to, you know, in our attempt to make them good uh, by trying to, you know, re by rejecting negative emotions. Uh, and it's very dangerous to do that. Uh, the psychodynamically, what happens is when we when you do that to a child, like say when a child is feeling, when a child is sad, when a child is crying, when you try to invalidate that emotion, when you say you know it's it's not good to have the emotion, children feel guilty of their emotions, and they think it's wrong to have the emotions. So the, what happens is they try to reject their own emotions. So when they are, when they become adults, the biggest problem is you know these adults. Uh, because they had lived their life rejecting their emotions, their emotional literacy, their uh, self-reflection of their emotions is not that great. So they, when, when, so when they are adults, they are angry and they don't know they are angry. Uh, they are sad, they don't know they are sad, and they think the world is wrong. You know, something's go. So they, they don't notice their own emotional uh, like uh, space. Uh, so we have to make children okay with negative emotions. It's okay to cry. It's okay to feel jealous. It's okay to be angry. But you know, you can ask them. You know, you can be okay to. It's it's okay to be angry, but you can't hit the sister. Something like that, right? So invalidating emotion is a very dangerous thing, and it's happening, and it leads a lot of negative consequences when they become adults. If I may ask a question. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> Everything that you mentioned, do do we do enough of this kind of uh, awareness in schools for no, children? No, oh, no. We, we actually we 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 started one, and Nivendra might start another one probably recently in the near future. Like we did one uh, with, but it's not with the mainstream school. The one of the private organizations they funded it, uh, but uh, uh, it's a program to enhance emotional literacy. Uh, in children, uh, we did it like we did like a, a trainers, uh, you know, training of trainers program. We where we took uh, some counselors and we trained them, and uh, but there is no like no skill building, no emotion focused approach in schools. Uh, probably and we we are like uh, we are. I'm working with uh, suicide prevention task force in Sri Lanka, so we. Uh, we try to implement such a program like we are in the process of planning it, uh, but I'm not sure how receptive the system would be. So I think one. 
Sorry, just one yeah. thing about that is Satipasala is another, I think, a name worth mentioning because they are also doing exactly that. And one of the initiatives they're working on, that's how we kind of started this whole mindfulness journey. We did it as a CSR and then we said we want to do it in the company as well. And one part they're doing is actually trying to take it to the schools, making kids understand what mindfulness is in simple ways like you know putting that marshmallow yeah. on the tongue and you yeah. know feel so i thought i mean those are great things yes. i hope we will continue when um lscg wants to help with those as well because it's not just helping us in our companies but we have to impact community if we want this to actually stay that's right uh, sorry, we are, we are just uh, running out of time and now the questions have started coming again. This is uh, a, a question related to children about corporal punishment, right? Whether they ask you whether it's good. Handi nogaha hadana hodda guti nogaha hadana lameku tekai, right? So what is the impact on uh, psychological well-being of children? I think uh, most of us who are working are parents as well. Uh, some of us, so I think that so we are we are seeing our children a lot more. So all these questions, you know, are coming about our children as well. So your thoughts on this? Uh, uh, well, uh, well, uh, one of the tenets of parenting is like your ability to set limits. Your ability to uh, guide them is very important. Uh, no, uh, no doubt about that. Like it is a kind of child abuse if you are not being able to do that. Like you no, know, your ability to uh, show them what's right, what's wrong. But this uh, punishment and reward method of like you know so-called star charts, like as reward and also punishment. Uh, Sometimes when we do that, uh, there is a prop. Uh, the biggest issue is. Uh, you are being, you are focusing on a behavior, right? It's like a training an animal. Uh, you are, you need some kind of a behavioral response from the person, and you try to inflict pain or inflict punishment on them to achieve that behavioral change. When you do it over and over again, what you are doing is you are invalidating the individual as a person. So inherent value of a person, because you are rewarding the achievement. Let's say. You overtly, you become, this is the actual biggest problem is not the punishment. Biggest problem is this conditional love. Uh, you, you appreciate them and applaud them when they do good only. And one of the, I remember when I worked in Melbourne once, a psychologist told me, one of the worst things you can tell them is a good boy. They said, like, you know, when you do that, like, you know, you know the bad boy would come, like your child knows that, you know, next time it, I would, I might, I might be the bad So overpraising, like, you know, trying to guide them, you know, this is actually a, a modern parenting trap where you think that you you shape the children, you direct the children by excessively praising or excessively punishing, and you are actually totally concerned about the behavioral change. So when you are not, when you are conditionally loving someone, the biggest problem is their understanding of themselves is not, is not uh, like, it's not, it doesn't develop. Because, because, you know, all the time you have to keep performing. These children, they become relentless performers when they, performers when they grow up. Like they would uh, achieve, they become the uh, prefect in the school, captain in the basketball team, uh, or they go to the medical college, but still they are not happy. Because the reason being, they, they, their life is a, an attempt. And entire life is an attempt to prove themselves, their worth. So that's the problem. So you have to accept them as individuals. Uh, and... Uh, uh then you can you know slowly guide them like you know it's not so there's it, no hurry it's that childhood behavior that negative impact that uh, trickles down later on in life and impacts our workplaces as well isn't it how we try to manage people even the senior management sometimes uh, you know they they don't know how to cope with their anger their their sadness their their distress so they may take it out on their subordinates and uh, there's one more question, and then I think we, we are at five o'clock and we should finish. Uh, what are the most effective ways of engaging uh, the millennials initiatives to enhance their mental well being? I think that's a good question because most of the uh, new workforce are the millennials, isn't it? So all companies have to deal with that. Bonnie. Wow. 
<laughs> I might have a good answer to that. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give the answer. Make but it Nivendra short, Bali. <laughs> Nivendra was part of the solution, <laughs> solution for us at LSCG. So what we actually did was, um, you know, we kind of played to their strengths in terms of, um, you know, if normally when you think of certain programs, we have them to be one, one and a half hours. We mentally made intentionally made them short programs because we one thing we do know is um you know i think in general it's better to do short bursts especially with all the uh, device time that we have um so what we did was we created um short programs 45 minutes very interactive programs where it was not sitting and listening it was actually engaging um, because it was all through technology, we had polls, we had storytelling, all those kinds of sessions. And it was more about getting um, the employees to talk about what they're going through. There, no judgment. It is not about saying what you're thinking is right or wrong. I think similar to what Venura said with kids. It's making employees understand that whatever they're feeling is validated, but to be able to be aware so that they know to take it away so that it's not in an unprofessional place or things like that. Because it's not to hide it, it's not to bury it, but to be able to be aware of it, to know where you can show it and when you, where you can't, just because we're in a professional environment and they work with customers, they work with colleagues. So far, we've signed up. We've got about two, three, uh, I think 250 employees who have signed up and we're doing it in small batches. Uh, so we're keeping Nivendra busy. <laughs> but I think that helped because the feedback we're getting is, yes, we understand. Um, and the fact that they're signing up and engaging and talking in these sessions for us is a validation that it helps. Nivendra, you want to add anything? Because you were in all the sessions. <laughs> I, I want to be in and out. Yeah. Yeah, I think another important thing is to uh, using their language. I'm a millennium myself. Um, I think uh, so I can relate to that. The fact that uh, language and, you know, looking at being aware of the cultural uh, connotations and nuances uh, with millennials becomes really important when you try to engage them uh, in different aspects of work. Um, and also knowing that, you know, uh, concepts like I think Dr. Venera can talk about this as well, instant gratification. Uh, this need to always feel pleasure and not being able to tolerate discomfort, uh, always needing what we call our dopamine hits, um, are things we also have to keep in mind when we engage with millionaires because it, like Barney also said, you can't expect uh, to have mainstream kind of uh, interventions with them all the time because those can prove to be ineffect ineffective. So we have to change uh, the approach that we take when we work with uh, this age group. Um, because I myself know that our attention spans, uh, mainly also because of our device use and the way we uh, distract ourselves, uh, we all have to really understand those nuances before we develop programs for this age group. Yeah. Dr. Venera? Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's a very good points, I think. Uh, actually, it, it has a lot to do with uh, the way they've been trained also, isn't it, Nimenda? Like they've been trained with a lot of uh, incentives, probably, like, you know, like uh, uh, individualism uh, being promoted massively in that age group. Uh, so uh, like your personal, uh, like you, your own personal gains, uh, growth, uh, your targets, your, uh, like, you know, that's been excessively emphasized in their growth process. Uh, so we have to, like, you know, so when it comes to a kind of a culture which needs some collective, collective thinking, cohesiveness, they can struggle uh, because that value system, they still have to sometimes uh, get ingrained in themselves. So then we might have to go slowly, like, you know, we might not be able to uh, like uh, artificially implant those value systems in them. So uh, making them feel connected, uh, making them un understanding them and like understanding that you know they can get frustrated easily because that's how they've been trained like you know they like as you know parents who are being cheerleaders in their lives sometimes you know uh, so they had these opportunities where they they were praised uh, you know there was uh, immediate gratifications uh, they were like uh, they were looking for the dopamine hits uh, and uh, so slowing down and enjoying could be difficult for them so noticing that is very important and then you can help them uh, 
Fantastic. One last question. A, a yeah. very quick, quick answer on yes or no. Can can colleagues be be helping other colleagues when they have problems? Should they always go to a counselor or a psychiatrist or a psychologist? Uh, can do you always need to seek a professional help? Can 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 your colleagues help you out? No. <laughs> of course, they, right. <laughs> <laughs> they should, I think, right? Yeah. They should Definitely. Yeah. So yeah. We, we all should be able, if we are compassionate, if we listen to others, we should be able to help others with their problems. So, so th I'm that engagement I'm within organizations need to be... And one word to use is we all need to cultivate a little bit more empathy and that would help a lot. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you all, the three of you, for gifting your valuable knowledge and time. You know, uh, so your the when I approached three, these three speakers, they were very happy to contribute to the welfare of people during such try, trying times. And also thank you, London Stock Exchange Group and Hutch, uh, for sponsoring Ceylon Chamber of Commerce in organizing this. And it was Nissan Sela and Gillian at the chamber who supported in everything. And it was Gillian's idea in uh, organizing such an uh, event, right? So the intention of this webinar was to give you sufficient uh, coping mechanisms to forge ahead by supporting each other and providing support at an organizational level. So the knowledge gained today should be, should be used to create more lasting impact within individuals, not just forgotten, listen to it and forgotten, so that you can change individual and organizational attitudes, work cultures, to ensure the most treasured resource, which is your human resource, is adequately taken care of. Right. So thank you all. Thank you for your participation. I hope you had a productive session. I think it's evening now. Good, good evening to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.